So hi everyone and welcome back to another uh, session of the series of conversations on corporeal architecture. And today I'm very glad to introduce Sarah Williams Goldhagen, a passionate advocate for high quality design. She was the New Republic's architecture critic for years, taught for a decade at Harvard's Graduate School of Design and has been an invited guest lecturer and keynote speaker at numerous universities and colleges in the US and Europe. She sits on the board of trustees of the Van Allen Institute in New York City and the advisory committee of the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. In 2017, she published Welcome to Your World, How the Built Environment Shapes Our Lives. And I am very honored to welcome Sarah here. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, well, I should say it's my pleasure, but it's actually been painful. <laughs> In the sense that um, you, this lecture invitation has sort of caught me betwixt and between projects. And so I'm going to raise various issues and I'm, feel free to interrupt me as I'm talking. And um, I, I, I'm hoping, I mean, I know that I find these issues very thought provoking. And so I'm hoping that you guys will have a lot of questions. I, uh, Maria also suggested that I assign some something to you. And so I assigned two chapters from the book, which are really two of the central sort of core conceptual chapters uh, in the book. Um, and so part of what I'll be doing is just going, as I reread these chapters, which I hadn't done since I published the book, which is in 2017, um, I was struck by just how much was sort of packed into them. And um, so I thought it might be helpful for all of us to just kind of go slowly over some of the basic concepts uh, that, um, and, and then discuss how they might be helpful um, to you. Wonderful. So, um, okay, so let me share my screen. Let's see, here we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. All right, so as uh, Maria said, I was the architecture critic for the New Republic for many years. Uh, many of them, uh, during the same time I was teaching in architecture schools. Uh, and uh, I'm not trained as an architect. Uh, although I have a PhD in architectural history. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. And so here I was situated in schools of architecture, teaching history and theory, actually. And I became increasingly struck by, uh, this was also, I should say, the time of sort of very high formalism informal experimentation, uh, parametric design had just started to take off the ground. Frank Gehry was doing his stuff, Zaha Hadid and so on and so forth. And so there was a lot of excitement and interest in how to make cool stuff uh, and build cool stuff. And that was all fine and good. I'm all for cool stuff. Uh, but what I was struck by was that there was a lot less discussion around how the people who were using these buildings would experience the cool stuff that the architects were making. Uh, and so um, I, I thought about this a lot. I watched, I went to critiques and so on and so forth. And I thought, you know, there must be some things that we can say about how people experience built environments. And so I started working on a book um, just about experiencing the built environment. And then um, I tend to be self-deprecating in my presentations and I will be here too. So, and then a lot of people sort of said, well, Sarah, you can't really tell people you're writing a book about experiencing the built environment because that's just too vague, right? And experience is a very vague word. It, it is, I mean, it means something. Um, it's a little bit like another word that is similarly vague that people use a lot. And I totally understand why they use it, but I also don't, which is atmospheres. It's like, what does that actually mean? Um, anyway, so 
And I started delving into, you know, basically anything I could find, cognitive neuroscience, studies in cognition, philosophy, literary criticism, whatever and ever. And I came to the conclusion, and I write this in the book, that, well, you know, maybe we can't really talk about experience um, because that's too vague, but what we can talk about is cognition. Um, and there are things we know about cognition. And um, so let's figure out how the things that we know about cognition can be helpful to us in thinking about how people experience built environments. And um, so now here I'm going through sort of some of the stuff I went through in the book. This is schematized, um, but also not inaccurate to say there are basically two kinds of cognitions. There are, on one level, when you're talking about levels of consciousness, there's conscious cognitions uh, and they're non-conscious cognitions. And conscious cognitions are like the, are language-based uh, and usually they are single percepts, like there's a tree in front of me over there, okay? Or, you know, the things that you hear yourself think uh, that are based in language that are kind of discrete and logical, uh, okay? Uh, and then there's a whole set of another cogn cognitions, which I found much more interesting and useful to think about in terms of experiencing architecture, which are non-conscious cognitions. And I use the word non-conscious. I'm somewhat of an outlier in that sense, but I like it because I want to suggest a kind of spectrum of consciousness. Uh, non -con you can have super non-conscious cognitions or you can have somewhat non-conscious cognitions or they can eventually be pulled into a conscious percept. Uh, okay, so then I began to realize it's really when we're talking about experiencing in built environments, it's non-conscious cognitions that we need to focus on. Uh, and I became very intrigued by the blind sight metaphor. Uh, have you guys discussed blind sight, Maria? Uh, no, we, we read for preparation, but we didn't discuss. We, we okay. Didn't OK, so I'll just quickly explain it. So the blind sight phenomenon was discovered in the 1990s by a group of cognitive neuroscientists who realized that there are some people uh, who are functionally blind, who think of themselves as completely blind. But if they have a certain pattern of neurological damage in their, in their visual cortex, um, they actually are able to see. They don't know that they're seeing, but they're able to see. And it's called blind, the blind sight phenomenon. And um, so they got a bunch of these people with a certain pattern of damage uh, into a room. They put them in a room, they turned off the lights, they turned on one light and they said, point to where the light source is in this room. Every single one of these people would have told you that they're totally blind. And yet they identified the, where the light source was uh, at a rate that was much, much higher than chance which suggested they were actually seeing something. Um, and then they did another set of experiments on um, people who had what co are called left hemisphere neglect, which is a certain form of blind sight uh, where you can see some, but you can't see others. And they showed this woman, uh, I think it was only one person in the experiment. So take that, um, I mean, remember that. Um, pictures of houses and she couldn't see to just her blind hemisphere. Um, and you see the, you know, a simulation of, of the pictures or a drawing of the pictures on the screen here. And um, they said, here's house one, here's house two, house one, house two, house one. Which house do you prefer to live in? And she said, the second house. Now she didn't see those pictures and had no way of knowing that there were flames coming out of one house mm -hmm. and not the other, but she consistently preferred the house that wasn't burning down. Okay. All right. So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all of this because it occurred to me that this is sort of an awesome metaphor for the ways in which the built environment affect us. Um, 
that most of the time we're living our lives. We're bickering with our husband or getting our kid ready for school or doing whatever we're doing in our lives or, you know, reading or this or that. Um, and all the time, the built environment is affecting us without us knowing it. Um, and so this was like the walk on the side, the walk to the, to get some milk section in these chapters was, was meant to be an extended illustration of this. Um, so I should just say there are two different kinds of non-conscious cognitions. And again, all of this is what over schematized as someone like Mark, Michael R. Beaver or cognitive neuroscientists will tell you, but for our purposes, I think they're useful enough. Um, have, sorry to interrupt you, Sarah, but we have actually Michael R. Beaver in the audience. So I, I know, hi, Michael. He can also- Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, don't correct me, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you can correct me at the end. Um, Okay, so there are direct non-conscious cognitions and indirect non-conscious cognitions. And um, the direct non-conscious cognitions, I mean, let's take uh, sharp, jaggedy edges, right? Um, that you see in on cut class or in a building by Daniel Liebskin or whatever. Um, we have sort of a visceral direct non-conscious cognition to sharp edges like that, like you want to recoil from it. Or the color red is very activating. Neurologically, it just is. Okay, so those are direct non-conscious cognitions. And then there are indirect non-conscious cognitions, which are mainly learned. And so that's what I want to focus on here. Um, For the indirect non-conscious cognition, sorry, I just keep piling modifiers onto cognition um, through this talk. It's just the way that it's it great. ended we up have going this, out. It's great we have <laughs> multi-layers and deeper and deeper perspective. Wonderful. Okay, good. Um, so one of the basic principles of non-conscious cognition, it is coming out. And this is what's happening as I was researching and writing this book that was so exciting was that phenomenology, which is now, now really been called situated cognition or uh, embodied cognition or inactive cognition. I mean, there's a number of different phrases running around, but they all sort of mean the same thing, even though there are differences among them. Uh, which is that our cognitions are, um, are shaped by our experiences in the world um, and by our inhabitation of the world. So let's take, so, okay. Can you see my cursor by the way? Yes. All right. So this wonderful Schlemmer drawing, you know, I, I used to take this drawing and compare it to Leonardo da Vinci's man in a square in a circle and say, well, we've gone from the Leonardo da Vinci to the Oscar Schlemmer um, in the sense that, you know, you have energy and perceptions moving out into the world and then you have the world moving back in to your, to all parts of your body really. Um, and that's how you are developing these non-conscious cognitions. Um, okay, so take, for example, walking along a rocky road. Um, you know, what is it you, just think of the experience of walking along a rocky road like this. Um, it's a tactile experience. It's a proprioceptive experience because you're constantly trying to sort of make sure that you're staying in balance. It's a visual experience. It can be an auditory experience and so on. Um, so you're using a lot of different faculties. It's multi-sensory, in other words, uh, in order to, in this experience of moving through the world, and you're using that even when you're standing still. Um, and so there's a kind of inside out, outside in relationship between the body and the, and the environment that pertains to the built environment as well. 
Okay. So piling on yet more modifiers, um, the basic principles of non-conscious situated cognition or embodied cognition or inactive cognition. Um, and that's why that rocky road was uh, a useful thing. Uh, one of the basic structures of this kind of cognition is that they're constructed through schemas. Uh, they're constructed through schemas of your own body, like your head is on top, your feet are on bottom, um, you know, up is good, down is smelly, um, you know, you can reach out in, in an extension in a way that mimics the horizon um, and so on and so forth. But this, what are schemas? Schemas are patterned sets of cognitive associations that become neurologically instantiated. And then you use them again, you rely on them, not only in situations that mimic the original situation in which the cognition occurred, but analogically. Um, to understand other things. So for example, the one I use in the book is important as big, just because it's such a simple example. Now, if you think about that phrase, important is big, there is absolutely no reason why the abstract concept of important should be associated with large physical scale. I mean, important is important. It has nothing to do with size, right? But we think of them because we have this cognitive schema that is, and this is meant to show you where this schema probably comes from, um, that important is big. When we were infants and helpless, the people, our caretakers were huge in comparison with us. And they were also the most important thing in our lives because we would die without them. So we have a neurologically instantiated non-conscious schema and sometimes conscious schema, important as big, right? Does anybody have any questions so far? I think there should be many questions. Please, uh, students. <laughs> Don't, don't be shy because this is very dense information. And if, if you would like to clarify something, please go ahead. <laughs> I think they are, they are processing and then in the end. That's okay, they're... that's fine. I'll just keep going and then we'll talk. And if they don't talk, I'll make them talk. We, <laughs> we, we will have talk, we will have conversation. No problem. Okay, um, so as I've suggested, the basic principles of these non-conscious inactive embodied situated schemas. Um, you can see how I'm just peeling layer after layer back is that as these last two examples have suggested both the walking on a rocky road and the important is big example is that they're intersensory, um, they're mapping different kinds of sensory, one type of sensory stimulus onto another kind of sensory stimulus. So um, in the Rocky Road example, example tactile and proprioceptive sim stimulus on, on to, um, what, or tactile stimulus onto proprioceptive stimulus and also onto auditory stimulus, okay. Um, so this is why Yohani Palazma and lots of other people keep emphasizing uh, a, an inter and mult or sometimes called multi-sensory uh, paradigm when you're thinking about how people experience built environments. Um, because one sense and especially the visual does not work alone ever, 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 okay? Um, now multimodal, uh, is something that is even more interesting. I assume that um, that most people have been introduced to Gibson's notion of affordances of how uh, there are things in the environment and they afford certain kinds of behaviors and certain kinds of interactions. Um, <clears throat> well, in my understanding, 
the notion of affordances goes even deeper uh, into the mechanics of how we actually perceive things in our environment, um, which, which is, uh, as this is the perception per is perception for action is a quotation from a French vision scientist whose name I didn't have time to look up, but he's very famous. Um, in any case, which means the following, which is that you, you actually can't perceive things in your environment without in one way or another simulating or imagining interacting with them. Um, and interacting with them tactilely, auditory, whatever way. Um, perception is perception for action. So if you think back to that Schlemmer drawing where you know lines going out, lines coming back in, this is like a more complicated and precise version of that Schlemmer drawing um, in the, when we say that not only is, are the schemas that we use to understand the built environment intersensory, but they're also multimodal. In other words, they use not only your sensory system, but they also use your motor system. Okay. And these pictures, I, uh, I really like as illustrations of this. The one on the right is uh, Allied Works's Clifford Still Museum in Denver. Whoop, 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 wait a minute, sorry. Um, and you, 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 you sort of can't look at that image and you can't stand in front of that building without imagining touching those surfaces. Um, I mean, it's, it's literally impossible to do that. So it's sort of a perfect illustration of the perception as perception oh, for action. One time of the year to be here, uh, to be able to meet old friends, talk, seek out new acquaintances. But if there's anything which the last year has taught us, it's really that uh, some things will never be the same again. If Here we are in what is now our second... Huh? We, had, we had an interference from a microphone. Sorry, it's no Sarah. Problem. Please no go problem. ahead. I was okay. trying to silence it, but because of the shared screen, it wasn't possible. Sorry about that. No problem. It's fine. I, okay. I would just uh, ask everybody in the audience to please again make sure that the microphones are off. It's fine if it's okay. Okay. Um, and the image on the left, uh, I, I just like a lot because it brings, it also consolidates a lot of the points that I've been making all along. Um, this is the staircase of Paimeo Sanatorium by Alvar Aalto. Uh, and um, here, I mean, talk about intersensory and multimodal. It's a staircase in which you, you walk uh, from an outside view up to another outside view, up to another outside view. So you're always sort of walking toward the light uh, in this wonderful way, particularly since this was a tuberculosis sanatorium. Um, and then you have this wonderfully sort of sunlit color um, symbolically on the staircase. And then um, Alto wrote this, this essay. Um, I'll talk more about Alto in a second in which uh, he was very interested in modernism. So lots of metal. This was the first building in Finland that had an elevator, lots of technical, uh, technical innovations. But for the banister, of course the banister is the, um, <clears throat> the aperture supporting the banister is metal, but he said, but you can't make a, 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 a handrail in metal. Why? Because metal conducts heat and cold and it doesn't feel nice on your hand. Uh, wood doesn't conduct uh, with that degree of variability temperature and so it's much warmer to the feel. So there's an architect who's thinking and designing through imagining how people are gonna actually experience on a very fine grain of detail the buildings that he's designing. Yes, Sarah, just a small uh, interference. Sure. Because this re reminded me now of a, a quote I read in, in uh, the most recent book by Johanny Pelasmus, Pelasma Inseminations, uh, that meant that uh, Alvar Aalto 
always had in mind how to design for the weaker man uh, in this sense of, of designing for the most uh, vulnerable, the, the one who would be most sensitive to all these tiny, tiny, uh, fine details. That's lovely. And actually, that goes to something that I often say in lectures is that, you know, look, a lot of the studies that we have uh, in environmental psychology and even to some extent in cognitive neuroscience around uh, come from people who are compromised in some way, who have neurological damage or whatever, whatever, you know, or disabled. Um, and, you know, my position is always, if those people are feeling things, I mean, unless they're functionally disabled in ways that most of us are not, like they don't have legs or something, um, you know, it's affecting everyone else too. It's just that they notice it more. Um, anyway. Um, uh, Sarah, just one more thing, because uh, you also, could you please go back to the slide with Oscar Schlemmer? I didn't mean to interrupt you then, but- No, it's fine. It's, it's also connecting because, you know, we are taking a lot of reference for Schlemmer in this, in this course also, and in general, in what I try to do with the students. And actually Stuttgart is the city of Oscar, of Oscar Schlemmer. He's even here at uh, Waldfriedhof and we have at the Staatsgalerie, we have his wonderful costumes of the Triadisch. Oh, really? Oh, lucky yeah. you. Yes, and now we have uh, Josef Beuys installation to celebrate the hundred years of Josef Beuys with uh, the reenactment of his interpretation of the costumes of Schlemmer in, the, in that room. So they are not in the usual display, they are up on some uh, pedestals and it's a completely different way also to see them and to interact them. But mm -hmm. I, had, I had to pick this up exactly because of what you were talking about schemas. Uh, and how we can look at these uh, costumes from the Triadisches Ballet exactly yeah. as this exploration of the schemas. And I mentioned this, that's why I interrupted Sarah, because our students are creating costumes for, uh, as a task for this, for this uh, course. Most of them are doing their shelters as a, as a costume. And so they are exploring exactly how to design an object which uh, uh, really transforms the body and, and works with this idea of the schemas also as a metaphor. Oh, so fabulous. It's, and if we had just a design correction before, that's why we got a little bit late and we were talking about this. So your input is completely synchronized. Cool. Just have cool. to say it. <laughs> <laughs> the transatlantic communication, non-conscious communication. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. Uh, okay, so going sort of tying some stuff together, if you want to talk about built environmental experience, it's, it's not only non consciously cognitive, which is what we're talking about, and not only visual, but physiological. Uh, and that's the multimodal part that I just made globally physiological in the sense like here's this wonderful uh park uh by helen and hard and stavanger in norway which i am mispronouncing but i can't uh i don't remember the norwegian pronunciation in any case um you know and uh, just to sort of i mean look on some level these points are obvious and on another level if you really stop and think about them they're not obvious at all and they have a lot of implications for designers like look at the image on the left you you can't not think about bouncing around when you look at those balls and you can't not think about sort of like a joyful bouncy playful quality right that's because of non-conscious schemas um of schemas that you have in your head so what I, what I, my plea is for architect, and I know I have a receptive audience here, um, is for architects to really think carefully and try to identify those schemas more systematically and then use them um, both now. Okay, so that's a, that's an indirect non-conscious cognition schema on your left, on your right with this bicycle, do you guys see this um, sort of flying up off the skateboard or whatever track? You know, that would be a, a direct non-conscious schema. It's basically in vision science, it's called trajectory completion. 
Like if you were standing more over here and you saw the slope of this thing, you couldn't help but think of sort of movement swooping up like that in a way. So in a way that bicycle completes your expectation of what you see um, in those things. This is, the, this is the kinds of considerations I think that, um, that will make design side of more, more profoundly embedded and, and intuited um, with, with what human experience is. Okay, so then I wanna get more specifically into something you just mentioned, Maria, which is metaphors. Um, so uh, the situated schemas that we're talking about are very often metaphorical. And the reason you have this truck up there is that the, the word metaphor is actually has a Greek root. And what it means, as you can see from this, this is a moving truck. Um, metaphor means literally taking meaning from one domain and transporting it, moving it into a different domain. Um, <clears throat> and these metaphors, or, which are schemas, um, are often based on the fact of our embodiment. In fact, most of them are based on our experience of embodiment. A rocky road. She's having a she's you know she's facing a rocky road. Embodied metaphor. Important is big. Embodied metaphor. Blue skies ahead. Hey, you know everything's cool, right? Blue skies ahead. Embodied metaphor. Okay, and in a metaphor, um, basically in transferring meaning from one domain into a different domain, there's a kind of a skewed fit, which is why they have this sort of poetic and literary quality to them, like she's facing a rocky road. Okay, so um, now I just, um, as I said, I'm sort of between projects uh, and sort of you know thinking about a bunch of different things to do next. So I thought it might be useful for me, and therefore uh, I'm inflicting this on you, but I think you'll find it interesting to go back to how I got interested in all of this to begin with, which is I started working on Alto. And in particular, I was doing research on the Vipuri Library uh, in Alto. And the Vipuri Library has a very interesting history in which Alto did a scheme, which is the scheme you see on the left, uh, and then the town sort of, the, there was a new mayor or something like that. They didn't know whether they were gonna have the money to do this or so on. So they shelved the project for a few years. And then when they came back to it, they switched the site. And um, when they switched the site, Alto uh, rejigged the design to some extent. So, and then he presented the drawings for the building that was eventually built, which is what you see on the right. Okay. so. Um, and the townspeople and lots of other people looked at him and, uh, and said, you changed the design. And Alto said, no, I didn't. It's the same design. You changed the design. No, I didn't, blah, 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 blah. Okay, right? Uh, Siegfried Gideon uh, in the famous space, time and architecture, the history of modernism, a very slanted and flawed history of modernism nonetheless, presents this as the moment at which Alto becomes a quote unquote modernist. But Alto insisted all his life, he hadn't changed the design. So I thought that was really interesting. And I went back, remember I, my original degree is in art history. And I started reading stuff and he said uh, he had a metaphor in mind as the foundation of this building, which is the municipal library. And that metaphor was that acquiring knowledge is like ascending a mountain, reaching plateaus, assimilating the information, going up to the next plateau. So you're ascending a mountain, learning, assimilating information into the light. Okay. And this is the sketch he made about how the Vapori library was going to work. And he was right. That design didn't change at all. In other words, the section of the building 
you go in here, you go up these stairs, you go up other stairs, and then you go into this incredible light filled uh, reading space, which is the main space of the library that didn't change. Um, and so, and a lot of Alto's work works with these kind of embodied or situated metaphors in a way. And um, okay, and then I began to realize that the architect on whom I wrote my previous book, Lou Khan, was doing something similar. This is Sherry Banglanagar, which is the parliament building in Dhaka in Bangladesh. And um, I wrote my first book on this building. In any case, so this is the parliament building here. This is the assembly building, assembly hall right in the middle, this ambulatory around. So he started, Khan started working on it. Let's go to the upper right image. Um, and then the, uh, then Pakistanis, because it was then Pakistan, um, <clears throat> came to him and said, we need a mosque. And he's like, I'm not putting a mosque in a government building. You know, he's an American. It's like separation of church and state is, is absolutely canonical. And then, no, we need a mosque. Muslims pray five times a day. We need to have a place where we can go to da 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 So he ends up coming up with this skewed axis as a solution to differentiate the mosque, which is this area right here and right over here, from the governmental building around it. And in fact, in lectures, Khan say, you see that skew in the axis? I put this building this way just so I could crank that axis in the opposite direction. Um, and so here's a, it, this is a political metaphor, but what is it based on? It's, a, it's, it's based on the idea that something that, first of all, categories are containers. That's a Lakoff and Johnson kind of thing over here on the right. Um, so things that are contained within a category are somehow discrete and have meaning within category there. Categories are containers and linear scales are paths. So a scale that is cranked off axis, axis is, is a different path. Uh, in other words, the religious path, not the political path. Um, <clears throat> okay, so at the way that I started thinking about all of this was thinking about embodied metaphors, uh, uh, which at, I remind you are schemas. Um, and which I got onto when I started reading Lakoff and Johnson, which have, a, they have a few books um, uh, identifying different kinds of uh, metaphors. Now, I, I just want to emphasize again, um, the usefulness of a metaphor is that it takes an abstract concept like, uh, like black and white, or I mean, that's not an abstract concept, like organization is physical structure, like categories or containers, like um, I broke up with him. Okay, so I just was saying that um, when I started thinking about this and I put the date up so I could show you how long I've been thinking about these things, 2012, I just started making lists of all the different kinds of metaphors that we use that rely on experience in the built environment. You know, I mean, you don't only say that buildings are structurally sound, you can say someone's thoughts are structurally sound. Uh, go back. Um, the previous, yeah, okay. No, Sorry. back, that's okay. Okay, there we go. Oh. Okay. Um, go to the next one. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, she's solid. Now that's an abstract idea uh, that she's like a good person, she's reliable, she's whatever, whatever. 
but it's it's a concrete metaphor, um, and so on and so forth. So you know, I, I hope one of the things that you're getting from this, and again, this is sort of me thinking out loud, is that I'm as much interested in how people think through their experience of the built environment um, as I am in the design of the built environment per se. Um, it's just sort of, that's just where my thoughts have been taking me. Um, Okay, and then next. So another thing that's also in what I assigned um, for you guys to think about, which is something I've thought a lot about is this kind of integrated relationship between long-term autobiographical or episodic memories and place and how that relates to the self-construction of identity. Um, because we know that uh, because episodic memories are consolidated in the hippocampus, which is also responsible for spatial navigation, um, we know that uh, most the most salient autobiographical memories that people have are placebound. Uh, and uh, I did discuss this in the book as well. And that isn't to say like that you remember everything of a place because of course memory doesn't work that way, but that you're gonna have artifactual resonances of aspects of the place in any long-term memory you have standing on the schoolyard and watching kids seesaw and you being to one side or you know running across the field uh when you were 12 chasing after your brother whatever whatever um <clears throat> and and sometimes those memories are created in these ways uh, in which non-conscious cognitions are invading. So that's in the walk in the village. I gave the example of, let's say you had a, an unpleasant conversation with your brother, um, but in fact, your body had kind of tightened up and recoiled because you walked past smelly garbage. Um, that smell that was really acrid and smell. And so that sort of set you on edge and then it ends up coming out in a social setting that has nothing to do with where you were physically. Um, and then that becomes a memory. Um, and so there's a, a place-based involvement in the consolidation of our most profound episode, what are called episodic memories, um, which suggests that the configuration of the built environment is profoundly involved in the construct in the way we construct our own sense of self and identity. Uh, and that I think that's a, a, a very powerful argument for thinking, carefully through the role of design in constructing in people, particularly children who are constructing their own series of episodic memories and narrative of their lives. And uh, just to end on sort of a personal note, I, when I was working on Welcome to Your World, I moved from Massachusetts where I'd been living for many years to East Harlem, which has the second highest concentration of public housing, uh, social housing in the United States, um, and is very, very poor neighborhood. And so I would, I would like work on my chapter, and then I'd go for a walk. And when I went for a walk, I'd walk by these housing projects, which were garbage strewn and horribly maintained and full of mold and doors had been pulled off and so on and so forth. And, and I would think what sort of self-concept are kids that growing up in these kinds of environments developing um, <clears throat> through, 
by living in the sorts of places that they're forced to live in. So I promised you that this would be a lecture on various topics, and there you go. <laughs> um, these are various topics, but that's sort of the end of the formal presentation, and now we can just talk. That's wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. And it's a bit of a pity that we, that we had a little bit this uh, interruption, but actually, I think it was also somehow fortunate because uh, there were a lot of dense uh, thoughts and there, it was also a chance to kind of let some of the ideas uh, settle. And before I give the word to our students again, who are already a little bit teased, they will come back with their own thoughts. They cannot escape. Um, I would like to, to start with our more in, informal conversation now, picking, picking up exactly this thread on episodic uh, memory, which I find a very interesting uh, topic. Also, the way you describe it also related, of course, to the anatomy of, of the brain and, and how we understand how we process these memories. But it also reminded me of a conversation I had uh, by email with uh, Michael Larbi, apropos one of, the, one of the chapters in his book. And I think that episodic memory is something especially when you mention it related to the concept of identity, it's also something that it's somehow fluid because it evolves uh, through our experiences and our interactions with, with the environment and with different kinds of, of environments. And I, I also find it especially interesting that you end now with this uh, example of how people maybe relate to themselves uh, taking in consideration the environment they are immediately exposed to or, or more used to. And this is something that for me is also very relatable because I grew up in a suburb from Lisboa. I, I lived in a nice apartment and I had all possible uh, comfort, but I had colleagues in school who were living also in housing projects and I, mm -hmm. I used to visit them to do school work and so on. And uh, some of them really lived in very difficult uh, conditions and I very often felt a little bit like the privileged alien who would who would uh, visit uh, these colleagues and often I, I, I was also somehow um, intrigued by the way many of them had developed their creativity to deal with these difficulties in the environment and some some had also much love to the to the places where they were they were living in and uh, they were small and they were packed and so, but many of them had a lot of care with these uh, small places, All, uh, others not so much. So this was also something, something that I can uh, relate to. And also my perception of, on these kind of, these kind of different environments cha changed a lot because uh, moving to Germany, for example, it, it has been a whole process of getting used to living in a country where we have things on very often on small scale because it's small, so size is more packed. And in Germany, the standards are much bigger. And very often what happens is when I go back and I, and I visit the same places that I remember from childhood and so on, my embodied experience of these places is completely different because I'm, I'm already swimming in a bigger pond, so to say. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the whole way the body adjusts to scale, volume, space, um, uh, tolerance for noise, uh, mm -hmm. thickness of walls, uh, it really changes. And, and I think that this is something very interesting to see uh, as this is a very personal report, of course, but how the direct experience of these changes in the environment actually makes changes in the human. And this is something that I can yeah. definitely attest for. Right. Interesting. Very good. Thank you. That's a very, very good point. Yeah. Um, yes, of course. I'm, I don't mean to suggest that these memories are sort of set in stone and don't change. They change all the time. In fact, they change every time you recall them. Um, they have to. Exactly. It's really an uh, interesting, interesting uh, adjustment. Um, and this is maybe, I, I hope it's not I don't think it's too personal because I found it on your Wikipedia page, but I happen to know that you live in a reconverted uh, church, right? Correct. And how, how is the experience of living, of having your home 
in such a, in such a building in such a space. Could you perhaps tell us a, a little bit about this? Sure, I, I'm happy to actually. Um, it, so it, it's a very modest church as far, as far as, I mean, don't think of something sort of grand and stone that it's not like that at all. Um, it was basically as East Harlem is a very poor neighborhood and basically a Pentecostal community parish um, bought a brownstone and then built out to the end of the site as you know lots in New York City most of them are, are basically 20 by 100 feet um, and so whereas the original building um, went back maybe 30 feet um, the nave of the church uh, stretches back from that 30 foot mark all the way back to the end of the lot um, on 100 and so it's the ceilings are 20 feet high um, and you get sunlight all day long, which is something that you don't really get in a New York City apartment most of the time, unless you're, uh, unless you're Jeff Bezos, um, and, you know, or one of these other guys. Um, and it's, I mean, I'm a little abashed to talking about it, but you know, when we walked into, it had been on the market forever. Nobody wanted it because of the neighborhood it was in. Um, and we walked in and the, the first phrase that came to mind is a little country church. And that's what it feels like walking in there. You feel like you're walking into a little country church. I mean, the other thing is because of its orientation to the street on either side, um, noise from the city cuts out completely. So you don't hear anything. So it really is this kind of sanctuary in the middle of Manhattan. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really special place. Um, the other thing that, from experientially that's kind of interesting about it is that almost all the space is public space. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has these like, well, my kids would complain that they their bedrooms were hovels, um, which which they a little bit were, you know, that like tiny, tiny, tiny little bedrooms. Um, so our whole life, I had two kids still at home when we moved into it, uh, was lived among each other, um, which which depending on which one of us you talked to was a good thing or not good thing. <laughs> but the scale is quite extraordinary because you do have these, you know, what, 12 to 15 foot high windows, one, two, three, one 20 foot high window um, and, and these huge ceilings. It's, it's, it's not what one normally gets in a domestic space. Uh, that, that's uh, that's why I had to think about it, Sarah. And thank you so much for for sharing this uh, personal experience. Um, also, in connection to what you mentioned about metaphors and body schema, because I imagine that when you would move to such space, and especially with your background as as someone who is a historian your whole body knows all of the history of this building. You know what it was designed for, the kind of rituals which were performed, the actions, the rhythms. So you specifically have a particular kind of reverence probably for, for such a space. And then oh, to in install your domestic life in such a space also probably adds an even more significant meaning to your daily life rituals, to... Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, yeah, it, completely. Um, it, it absolutely does. I mean, we're very, very fortunate. Um, so now, now I would like to, before we go to our students, they might have a few, need a few more minutes before they make some uh, questions. I would like to ask our guests maybe to make some questions to Sarah because I think Michael R.B. probably would have a comment. Oh, Maria, I have a quick question, please. Yes. And by the way, I can't find a place where I can raise my hand. I don't have access to that. Uh, it should be in uh, reactions. 
No, not in mine for some reason. I don't know. It doesn't appear, but that's okay. Well, I wanted to to thank Sarah for this this beautiful lecture. I really enjoyed it. Especially knowing that you are somewhere camping in the woods, which is very close to me. But <laughs> I think that, you know, what, what you're telling us today is, is again an important reminder that we all have uh, truly, truly have an ethical responsibility uh, because what we do, you know, shapes lives and memories and, and human interaction in, in our communities, right? In, in a very, very deep way. And I believe that this, this idea of ethical responsibility of architects and interior designers and urban planners needs to enter schools of architecture right away, right? This, this is urgent. We need to have courses in ethics right from the very first, first year in all of these disciplines. But, you know, my question for you, Sarah, is, uh, why do you believe that there's so much resistance uh, still among architects, among educators, even to this type of approach in design? Is it simply that, you know, we are sort of some of the pioneers, right? Thank you to, all, to you all. And that others are, you know, still, still trying to understand what sort of transformation needs to happen? Is it just that people are too set in their ways? within academia, what needs to be done to wake people up to the importance of psychology and metaphor and really the social ethical dimension of design? Um, well, to answer your question, I mean, the easiest answer to the question is to say all of the above, uh, which I think is true. Um, one thing in terms of ethics, uh, I hope that I conveyed that, um, you know, I came from a PhD with architect in architectural history. Um, actually, the ethics started to become a question for me once I started writing criticism for the New Republic, um, because then I had a public platform and I was like, okay, what is it that people need to know? Uh, and, and how should they be thinking about architecture? So it's always been an interest of mine. I'll just caution you, Tatiana, and I may not need to say this, is that when I have raised this topic directly, um, people don't want to hear it, uh, and they don't, and they don't want to hear it because they think they're being preached to. Um, and people don't like to be preached to. I can tell you, personal experience. <laughs> um, so it, it's something to, it, it's something obviously it needs to be discussed. And, and as I said, I came out of history, but then I moved to East Harlem and I looked around me and I thought, wait a minute. I'm writing this book on experiencing the built environment and here are people whose lives are getting, excuse my language, fucked. And it's partly because of the environments that they're in. And I need to think about that. Um, that's important. Um, and so now I talk about it a lot, but it, it, it's, it's tricky and you and I've had this conversation before, but now we'll have it a little bit more publicly. Um, one is, I mean, let's go back to my initial question to myself, which is experience. How do people experience certain designs versus other designs? Um, and what does that mean about how we should be designing? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, not that I oppose to identity politics, but within the academy, I think that identity politics arrests some good discussions. And, uh, and I think in the academy, uh, so, many dis so much emphasis is put on particularism. Uh, and the particularity of of a woman's experience versus a black woman's experience versus an Indian, Asian, brown person's experience, et cetera, et cetera, that um, approaching 
these more general issues that are many of which are really transcultural, not completely. That's why I think place is such an interesting problem because place is hugely uh, site-specific. I mean, it's by definition site-specific, but um, <clears throat> so I, I, I think that there's just sort of a lack of fit with what we're doing and the, the general orientation of humanistic discussion within the academy right now. Um, but I don't think it's gonna stay that way uh, because, uh, and I have come to the conclusion that the way in is through public health. Tatiana, thanks for, for your great uh, question and to bring this up. And um, Sarah, this was also very interesting that you connect this again to these politics of, of identity. And I had to think about, um, about the book of uh, Criado Perez, Invisible Women, and uh, how she talks, how she discusses also how, um, and she does this also grounded in, in research, and how most of our environment was really shaped, uh, tailored to this uh, standard of the male body and something which still comes from standardization and from the 50s. And there's so many interesting examples for, from uh, your bicycle to doors to bathrooms. And, and, and it's really interesting also to see how I read this book and, and I could already understand how me as a, as a woman with a woman's body had already adapted and normalized many things that I forgot were, were actually not what felt right for my body in terms of interaction with, with a, lot of, a lot of things. So often we bring also into these discussions with our students and I'm also teaching here ergonomics and I often give also my example of someone who doesn't fit the German standard so everything is much bigger than my size and so on. Um, but it's a very practical example, scale, for example, on you, you can feel it with your body that if the scale is really not adjusted to, to your proportions or to your needs, you feel that something isn't, isn't quite okay. right. And we don't have a standard human, human. And this is something that we, that we now can really consider. I agree. And what, um, one of my favorite examples is is from workplace design research in which it was discovered that um, open plan offices are great for men and terrible for women because women hate being watched. I mean, they're just on show all the time in these open plan offices. Um, and you know what it's like, <laughs> so, right? Um, so, I guess my point, and maybe I'm not being so articulate in, in saying it, is that these differences definitely exist. They absolutely exist. And we need to be attentive to them. And we need also to be attentive to, uh, to things that are not that different. Um, you know, I mean, I, I was interviewed by one woman who was a doctor uh, who was trained as a doctor, was interested in embodied in the stuff I do, whatever. And, um, and she said, you know, she said, oh, you mean it's a problem that people, you know, she said, I'm a doctor. It's like a heart's a heart. Um, you know, shoulders are shoulders. <laughs> and so I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I think that the discourse on one is pushing out the discourse on the other. That's what I'm trying to say. I will just make a, one comment before I give the word to Lily, who has been raising her hand already for some time, just a moment, um, because uh, I recently I started to watch a series of documentary on, on Netflix about the human body. And I, of course I have to watch it. And I watched only the first episode, which was about the nervous system. And one doctor was mentioning, oh, how interesting these possibilities we have now to take a look at the brain and the nervous system. And also to understand, we, we are still uh, thinking, uh, thinking about the body and studying the body, very influenced by um, what we learned about the assembly line. So we can really take a look at each one of the parts and go very, very deeply. But I thought, mm -hmm. mm, 
actually, I'm not, I'm not happy with this approach. <laughs> so I decided not to continue to the second episode of, of the documentary because we know that this Cartesian way of looking at the body as a system of parts is actually part of the problem. We are not seeing the embodied whole. We are not seeing the interconnection between, between things. Mm -hmm. Lily, please go ahead. So Sarah, I am so happy to, first I have to point, oh, oh my gosh, there's so many things I want to tell you. So, um, <laughs> well, the, the, I first became aware of, of your work through Khan's book, you know, Situated Modernism, which, because I give tours there. I've met you at Salk Institute in the past that you gave a, a lecture yeah, there. And um, it just, so on, on, I have to say, I know about self-deprecating humor. I'm also from New York, but I think um, I just want to state how articulate you are. And it's so the way that you just described from going from, and okay, so I want to point out a very specific thing that I just, it just soothed my soul is when you brought up the word non-conscious. Because in ANFA, I've been going to these lectures now for 17 years, and I hear neuroscientists, you know, because I'm an architect, I hear neuroscientists say non-conscious, subconscious, con uh, non-conscious, subconscious, and almost like non-conscious slash subconscious. And, and, then, um, and then I've been co-teaching a class uh, this semester, first, first class I've ever taught co-teaching it with a scientist who actually brought up the term non-conscious. And I was like, oh, like my whole body just melted because I've been having this, This because I asked him, I said, why are people using unconscious? He said, well, unconscious is a Sigmund Freud, is a, is a Freudian right. thing, right? He explained this whole thing to me, which I had no idea. And then subconscious, is a neurological thing, you know, it's, and, but non-conscious is the word I had been looking for for so long. And now you clearly, I mean, just your slides, just, oh, just from the, from, from the microscopic to the macroscopic, from, 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 from actually, you know, cells creating these non-conscious pathways over time to then the metaphor, which is the schemas that have been incorporated in our lives non-consciously, as well, and just those slides were so clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and, you for um, saying that. <laughs> and no, no, really, thank you <laughs> from the bottom of my heart. And then bringing in a beautiful Gibson quote, which I will have to look up who wrote perception is perception for action, because that's also a because I've all, you know, I, I love Gibson using them in my, him in my oh, lectures. Oh, that, that's not from Gibson. That's a, right. in, I have to look up the, the, notes. The, the French it's in guy. It's my book. It. Yeah. So, but, but I know, yeah, so, um, so, and also the idea of um, just what, what Maria was just bringing up and Tatiana was just bringing up about this universal versus kind of the social construct, you know, are, are we, are we neurological beings, you know, what do we have in common? And then what have we learned over time through language and culture, through our embodied experience as a woman, as a man, as a child, as an adult, as an old person. So this battle between universal and, and, and socially constructed to me is, is, a, is a really, is, is, is kind of at the heart of those schemas that, that, that have, have, have developed over time. And that as women, we have adapted to the world of men or as, uh, and so, um, <laughs> because um, there's a whole subculture at, at Salk Institute of Women, because I've been working there, you know, as a, as a docent uh, for 17 years, but it's just such a mat, you know, like we're telling the story of these two people, Dr. Salk and, and, and Khan, you know, creating this beautiful space and, you know, how these, but the women of Salk, there's a whole other culture and subculture and appreciation and support of the building and I just, I feel like you're, I know you said you're between projects. So I just wanted to open up a dialogue and perhaps, <laughs> um, you know, perhaps we can do something towards that end. And I, I just, um, just planting a seed. And also I, I I'd love to hear more. At, Cause I, I wrote uh, for my doctoral, uh, well, I, I, I got a, a doctorate in teaching and learning at UCSD. And part of it was, um, uh, I took a class called Voices, um, 
was with, a, a, I, I can't remember his name. He was a, he's a deaf professor and he wrote a book called, um, I don't know, it was a great book and it was a great class. And I got to write about the, uh, uh, like in the, the women of Salk, that was my paper. And I was just, um, I delved into all the archives. And But I mean, your ability to take these concepts and to really synthesize them and thread them together in woven like cloth. And I really appreciate your, your you know, this is really incredible. You are a really incredible woman. So yeah. the New York <laughs> self-deprecating humor, the new, Aside, aside, we're gonna we're gonna dispense with that. Let's take a you know a more embodied approach. <laughs> um, yeah, and also, I'm you. teaching this class, phenomenology of space, this summer, and I've uh, a couple of people. Doc, Dr. Michael Arbib spoke last week. Um, Eduardo Macagno, and please correct mm -hmm. me if I'm saying your name wrong. Is it Macagno? I don't know if he's still here. And it's Macagno, um, I think. Macagno. I think it's Macagno, right? Or Maria, which one? Macano, Macano. It's Macano. It, That's how it's pronounced. It's, it's an Italian. Exactly. Oh, okay. He told it in our conversation. I made the same mistake. Yes, it's from Italian. Oh, okay. Because I thought he corrected us in the opposite direction. Macano. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, I like to. I like that people pronounce names right. So, um, and then I'm, I think Eve might be speaking as well. So I've just would if if I could please send you um, my syllabus and see if there's any. Oh, please. Absolutely. Yeah, I would love that to. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Great, sure, more, more connections. You. More connections uh, spawning from, from this uh, <laughs> space. It's wonderful. It's exactly one of the, one of the reasons why we do these conversations. Uh, Michael R.B., please go ahead. You have your hand raised also for some time. Okay, um, can you see me? Yes. All right, well, I, I'm very nervous now, of course, being a white male. Um, and uh, I, I speak as a typical white male born in England, raised in Australia, living in America, trained as a mathematician, interested in the brain and architecture. Um, and I want to say two things in response to Sarah and one thing in response to Maria. So in response to Sarah, I think it's very interesting that when you listed metaphors, they were all expressed in language. And so the point I want to make there is that the story of embodiment is only part of the story, right? And, and in a way, you said that when you talked about conscious perception, but I want to say that conscious perception can be embodied if I'm basking in the sun uh, on a beach. Uh, my experience is nonverbal. Uh, but conscious. And on the other oh. hand, when we, so, so I just want to say that I have a lot of trouble with some of the people who push embodiment without looking at the way in which culture impacts us both through the body and through the language in which many of our cultural norms are expressed. That's not a criticism of you. I know you agree with that, but I, I just wanted to raise that point. Um, the other thing is that schemas, um, I agree with you about the importance of schemas. The one thing I add in my own approach is that when we face a new situation, we are often combining multiple schemas. We see a situation right. where there are new objects we haven't seen before. So that's another dimension uh, that uh, enriches your viewpoint. So mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, is in no way a criticism, Sarah, of your lovely presentation, but rather just to point out dimensions that I, I think uh, enrich what you've talked about. So um, do you want to respond to that before I sure. give Maria a tough I mean, time? On the schema is the second point. Uh, just um, uh, first of all, you don't, you don't need to be worried about being a white male. I'm married to one of them. So, and you know, they're okay with me, white males. Me too, <laughs> um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in terms of schemas, you're absolutely right. And had I, had I been able to do a longer talk, and that's one of the things I'm thinking a lot about, the way that these abstract ideas get translated into more concretized, uh, visualizable or whatever schemas, and then combined uh, to make sense of another abstract ideas. And um, I'm actually, there's a really interesting writer, he's there, co-authors, one is, is, is Turner and the other I think is Falcon. Yeah, you talk about mental spaces 
as the places where schemas uh, get combined in order to cope with new experiences. And that's, a, I think it's a really important point. And I think it needs, uh, I, I wanna think about it more. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, now, now the next is um, criticism of Maria uh, for her last statement that she didn't like a Netflix series that approached the body in terms of focused research on its parts. And she only wanted a holistic approach. And I'm sorry, Maria, but I don't think that's a good attitude. It seems to me that we make progress in our understanding by the dialogue between the holistic and the analytic. I mean, you're, you're working on a building, okay? So you want to get a vision for what the whole building is and how it will impact people. But in the end, you need to do the structural engineering. You don't want it to fall over. You're going to choose materials. Uh, there had to be material research to come up with the palette from which you choose the materials you want to use. Um, you focus for a while on a doorway. Uh, you focus even on the doorknob. What will match that doorknob to the abilities of a person? What's the height of children around? What's the knob if you've got old people who may not be able to, to grasp it effectively? So I, I really am disturbed that you would cancel attention to a series that focuses on the parts rather than ask yourself, how can I learn more about the parts to then carry it back to my holistic view and then enrich that view and then maybe pose more questions to the people who are working on various parts. Say, oh, how does this part relate to the whole? What do I need to know about it? And just one final comment. One of the things we've talked about a lot is brain imaging. Well, if you don't believe in the importance of parts, you will never look at brain imaging as relevant data for the neuroscience architecture conversation because that says, oh, the hippocampus is lighting up here more than it does there. The frontal cortex is doing this in this case and not in that case. So Maria, I implore you in your own work and in teaching the students, don't make holism the enemy of analysis of the parts, make oh, it the oh. partner in going back and forth between part and Absolutely. Part. My, thank you. Thank you for bringing this up because I think this is a current misunderstanding in, in a lot of our discussions and conversations um, because in fact, what, and the way you described it with this metaphor from the building is exactly the way um, that I also try to think and um, incorporate uh, these ideas. And also with my seminars with the students as much as possible, I try to give a wider approach and a comprehensive approach. And what I meant about the series and this criticism about this particular comment in the series was not the attention given to the study of each part in itself as it relates to the whole, uh, which is actually a basic uh, humanist uh, principle of, of understanding the macrocosms through the microcosms. And I think that this, of course, can uh, and very importantly be applied to the study of the body and, and also to architecture, as you also referred exactly the impact of the doorknob um, to, to the rest of the building and or in, as Bauhaus would say it from the spoon to the city. And of course, all parts are inter interconnected to the, um, to the whole. What I meant was in this particular segment of the documentary that there was a comparison with the assembly line. Uh, and that, that was the part that made me a little bit nervous about the documentary. And okay, maybe there is an idiosyncrasy there since I, I try to reflect a lot on how this thought uh, or how some effects uh, or way of thinking that came through uh, industrialization, uh, especially in the 50s, how they, they affected our way of thinking. And for example, from the point of view of diversity, how they had a direct impact. And standardization is one of the examples where this kind of thinking through parts uh, had consequences which are not completely uh, positive. But we have developed much more uh, from, from the 50s and from that way of industrialization and that, that way of thinking. And now we have possibilities of uh, mass customization and all sorts of of ways that that also make this way of thinking through the par through the parts much more uh, deep and interconnected to the whole. So in no way I am establishing a 
any any kind of dictatorship of holism or whatever I th as most as possible the what I, where I aim with this with this course and with all my courses is really to as much as possible bring together the perspectives of uh, architecture art and science uh, that was uh, and also in connection to the industry of course that was uh, one of the or the founding uh, principle of of the Bauhaus and that's still what I what I strive to somehow replicate and put into context nowadays. But thank you for bringing this up. I think it's very important. Would you like to comment back? No, I'm happy. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, now I want to give the word to our students who had a lot of time and were already exposed to our flow of thoughts. We are having a really interesting discussion. We went through many uh, deep and important topics. Uh, but now it's your time. It's all right with everyone, I'm going to have a go. So Sarah, thank you so much for your talk. It was really interesting. And uh, from my point of view, I'm studying architecture. I'm doing my master's next semester. So I'm studying on my master thesis in, I think, September, around that time. Um, and the one thing that struck out for me the most from your talk was the fact um, when you talked about um, the image with uh, the guy on the bicycle jumping in the air and um, basically talking about what we as architects can plan to do with the space we have and stuff like that. And so especially from your point of view, since you studied history of architecture um, to what extent would you say it is good as an architect to kind of like foresee the future and try to plan into the future um, because I have the feeling that some architects uh, nowadays try to kind of like plan for just the now so the present and not really look into the future with basically the fact that people can make spaces their own, giving time. Um, so I was wondering how much should we actually try to develop this one idea that you have to use the space in such a way in the future, uh, whether it's to people can make the places their own. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I'm not sure I can give a programmatic answer to that because I think it depends a lot on the circumstances in which you're building and the culture in which you're building and the typology um, in which you're building. But I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, there, David Ajay, when he was, uh, designing the Museum of African American History uh, was sort of collared by uh, a woman who was responsible for all the branch libraries in Washington, DC. And she basically convinced him to design two new branch libraries. Um, so here you have a public building, a, a very small, uh, community library, essentially. And um, they're both really, I don't even love David and Jay's work, but one of the, both of these buildings, but particularly one of them, I really think was wonderful. And the building is wholly responsive to the site. It's in a very poor neighborhood, but it sits on the edge of a kind of under maintained a little bit wild public park. Um, and okay, so what he did was he made the facade mirrored. So you basically double the amount of greenery you have in that neighborhood visually by mirroring all that kind of wild unkempt nat nature that's around it. Um, 
And then he, the structure is a diagrid that is thickened on the interior and the steel beams are, sort of, are covered with wood and it's pulled up in some places. So it emphasizes like the verticality of the place and pulled out into much more horizontal sections in another part of the library. And in that part of the library, uh, the thickness of the diagrid and the wood, he basically had people put cushions on them so they become reading cubby holes. Um, and it, it's just, it's an incredibly kind of sensitive, smart design. Now, it doesn't have to be a library to have those cubby holes that people are going to want to crawl into, right? Because they're human scale. Um, it doesn't have to be a library to suddenly sort of double the amount of greenery they have in their neighborhood on the exterior. It can be a supermarket, but because it has that mirrored facade. So there's an example. I don't think David and Jay was thinking about future uses for this building at all. Um, he was looking at the program and doing his thing. Um, but good design will do that. You know, if that became a community center, it would still be as cool and as and as wonderful a place to be in, and as as much of a kind of icon of that neighborhood. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, whatever it is that we're promoting in terms of design, and I hate the term, but sometimes I call it human-centered design as opposed to object-centered design. I mean that. You know, it's sort of ugly, but there it is. Um, if you do human-centered design, it's going to be gracious with a lot of uses. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, I wanted to thank Mario for his question. Great question. Uh, it really is. Yeah, and it's, it's absolutely a crucial point. Mario, I mean, you're really onto something. You said that you would be starting with your thesis soon, and maybe some, this is something you might want to address. You know, when I think of the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, for example, and many other architects worked in a similar way, but Wright designed buildings for how they would actually evolve in time, right? Mm -hmm. And for how you know the lives of the residents of his spaces would also evolve in time. So he made his designs flexible and, and malleable so that people living there could actually shape, you know, be empowered to shape their spaces as their mm -hmm. needs, you know, changed in time. But I think I would add something to your point that it's not only about the future, it's also about the past, right? Would you agree, Mario? Uh, you can turn on your mic. We can have a conversation, but yeah, you know sure. because because obviously you know architecture exists uh, within a spectrum of time. So I think it's very important uh, to have subtle references or not so subtle in your work also to the past and to memory, as Sarah reminded us today, you know so beautifully. We can have references to the past that are you know, the users of our spaces will really feel with their body and with their, their memory, or as Yohani Palazma might say, their genetic memory. And so it's very important to find ourselves involved in, in our architecture within that spectrum of time, to be able to feel the past or the memory of a place, a site or the work of architecture, but also to be able to look into the future and to shape our spaces as our as our needs evolve. So I think you you captured a really critical dimension here in our conversation that, that we need to expand further together. 
Tatiana, this was an amazing input because you have a complete intuition without knowing. And Mario is doing his uh, shelter, his installation mm -hmm. uh, in a space, which is a brewery that uh, belongs to his family. So it's a wonderful opportunity for you, Mario, to exactly bring together this idea of, of a space with, with memory and a particular kind of memory also. Uh, Mario showed before a picture of this uh, space with the brewery machine and all of that. Mario, would you like to show it to us perhaps and then we would have a visual? Yes, yeah, sure. Let me look it up. And this is a wonderful opportunity to, to bring these ideas uh, together. And as Tatiana was mentioning, uh, to think about our body schemas and also th the potential of activating in our, in our bodies, in our nervous systems, in our memory, exactly this quality of memory and what connects us to specific spaces and the atmospheres and qualities of these spaces. Ma Maria, can I, can I just uh, kind of bring in a thread from a previous talk, conversation? Absolutely, yes, go ahead. So uh, remember Zachariah Jabara? Jabara, yes. Well, Jabara. So when he asked, you know, what, how would you design a space for a bird, or how would you design a space for a fish, and and I had a, a, a realization um, that the that we look to the organism that we're designing for, like we have a mental image in it that is separate from ourselves, right? But to really embody like the idea of who is going to uh, inhabit this space and what is the affordances that they would look for in their environment. And um, to offer these, like, like Tatiana is saying, this reference to the past, these, these, these schemas that have built up in our body. So, you know, the way a bird would come into a, 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 a nest or the way a, a, a fish would walk, um, to really kind of think about their past schemas that have been wired into their brains, the way they have embodied their spaces, and then also the potential for action, right? So you understand the people who are going to be using this space. They are your family, they are friends of your family, they are visitors, they are people who drink beer, I suppose. They are people who celebrate and social gathering. So imagine them to be the bird or the fish. And so they're coming and you have this, this rich data, maybe from anecdotal experience, but also this, you know, everything you're learning from Maria with relate, relating to the body and um, nervous system. So you have to see this space as not only something like it's a nest, it's a tree. It's, it's something where they come together. What will they, and it's a, you know, uh, just like what, how can they interact with the environment? What are cues that they need? What are affordances that they need? What are, you know, you know, if you can set certain datum that they're, they're going to be, uh, there's going to be the height at which you put down a beer glass. There's going to be a height at which you, you sit and have a conversation. There's going to be a height at which you, you know, the, the flooring, the textures, the changes of, you know, all these changes, the lighting level, the acoustics, all of these things are affordances, right? But they're based in the past, the present, and the future. Can, can you see it that way? I mean, that, that's, that's, that, that was my takeaway from that particular lecture. Well, Lily, I think that was very well put, but I think we can also summarize uh, this discussion in that, that we need to really review the role of the architect in the design process relative to what should we call them, the users, the subjects, I hate all of those words, but the people who are going to occupy our spaces, right? Somehow those roles are being joined right now or reversed. You know, I remember studying at Berkeley and being obsessed with the work of Mikhail Bakhtin, who wrote about, you know, the author and the reader and what happens when those roles can actually be reversed in some sense. You know, can the people who occupy our spaces, can we really give them the power to shape their spaces and redesign them as they need. So that means that the role of the architect 
changes really at the core. This is what's so important to understand. And how do we teach that, right? The role of the architect then becomes to create this very loose uh, framework, right? We can even talk about fields, but that's another conversation. Maybe we'll bring in Sergei to talk about this, but we create this loose framework within which then interactions are possible and interactions can change in time and, and be dynamic and engaging, right? Uh, and, but the importance is that, you know, the architect needs to become more humble mm -hmm. in that sense to allow that freedom and to allow multiple perspectives and multiple viewpoints. This is really what we're speaking about now in, in this entire effort. Thank you, Tatiana. Tatiana, this is a great point. And I, I know that you happen to work in Portugal with Alvaro Siza. So you probably, you know, surely very well his work with Malagueira. Of course. And, and this was a participatory project uh, yeah. where the citizens were directly involved in shaping uh, in shaping the neighborhood as, uh, as it became. So they, they were not just consulted somehow, they were active participants in this cre creation process. Absolutely, and I actually participated in the Malagueta project as well, and created several buildings, including a community center there. So that was a beautiful project, uh, but it was not the only one by CISA where participation was encouraged. And, you know, there's the idea of community participation in the process, but there's also the idea that I spoke about a few seconds ago which is that the architect does not complete the structure. It's as Mario was telling us, right? Very perceptive that we, we don't just design for a single moment in time. And yet, why are we teaching our students to design for a single moment in time, a work that can be appreciated mostly with our visual senses and, and nothing else? That's ridiculous, right? So we need to learn how to teach for in the full spectrum of time and to be much more humble and take a back seat so that our readers, yes, going back to Bartin, our readers can really have the power to construct their own space according to memories of the past and looking into the future. But this is, this is a big discussion, it needs more time. Yes. Can, I, can I just intervene with one comment? Um, talking about earlier, meetings, we, we had uh, Andre Yelich talking about uh, memorials. And what's interesting there is whose memories, uh, if you're building a Holocaust museum, how do you design um, where the memories are that of guilt and restitution, if you will, rather than a celebration for neo-Nazis? So I think that adds just another dimension to this um, evocation of, of memory when you design. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, if you have a neo-Nazi come to you and say, build me a house that has a shrine for Hitler, do you say yes? What would you do, Tatiana? I'll pass on that question at the moment. Yes, very wise. I, I think that that kind of design normally doesn't reach architects. I think that they are, they are done, um, uh, they are self-made in these ways, and actually, we I, I witnessed a lecture by Professor Stefan Trubi, who worked with Rem Rem Kulas and in the elements of architecture, and he's also here in Stuttgart. And a um, few years ago, he did a lecture in Kaiserslautern where I was working, and he approached the topic of of this kind of uh, neo-Nazi architecture, which has unfortunately been reappearing in Germany and Austria in, in recent years. And these are completely spontaneous self-made self uh, ventures, uh, which of course have no, no fingers of any self-respecting architect on. But this is something that we are also aware of that there's also this other side of, of memory that, that exists and they are not all positive. And I think that there are still uh, bodies on <laughs> on our planet that have a distorted sense of memory or particular senses of memory. Um, can I just can I make just one tiny no? Yes. Comment? Please. So I think with this, you know, when you, we talked about ethics, we 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 began I think this conversation talking about ethical perspective or 
I might be remembering last night's lecture. Um, <laughs> there are all the days are run, running together. Um, but I think that an architect's goal, there will be times, and in, in my lifetime, it has happened, you know, I, my values did not align with my client's values. For example, I had a client in the middle of a project uh, reveal to me that she wanted gun drawers, drawers where you kick the, you kick the toe kick and all of these guns would pop out of the cabinetry. And it caught me off guard. She's like, well, of course you're gonna incorporate gun, gun kicks, she called them, into her house. And it was in the middle of the project and I realized that I didn't align with this. But I think that anytime you are faced with an ethical decision, should I take on this, you know, maybe I, you know, when you're faced with an ethical decision in my, in my life, in my, in my practice, is that I approach it from the standpoint of, can I create value at this moment? And so I revealed to her, you know, my, that I didn't like guns and that I didn't, but that I would be happy to help her if she felt that she needed these guns for protection. And it's in, and so I created a dialogue, a social dialogue in which she knew my, my personal opinions, but yet we were proceeding with the project and she said, okay, I'll just talk to the cabinet guy about it and we won't bother you about it. So um, I think there is a role for architects in this ethical discussion about global architecture and how we can, you know, if we, we if I've had arguments with, 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 like my structure was blocking someone else's view. So what do you do in that case? Who is the community? Is the community the person who's building the two-story house that's blocking the views of all the people behind him? Um, or is the community... So, so the role of the architect though is at every point, at every juncture is to consider points of view, be open with your, your ethics, but also to engage in a dialogue because I, I think a dialogue a dialogue is, is important. I, I don't know if this makes any sense to anyone. Mario, does it make sense to you? I think um, uh, we, in the meantime, we, we didn't see Mario's oh, yeah, picture on the of brewery, uh, but, but uh, Mario is not really transforming the brewery for this design project. He's just installing uh, we are working with this object over with this kind of self-made uh, objects and installations. Uh, so he will install these objects he has been creating in a dialogue with uh, with uh, with the brewery space. Um, I don't know if any of our students would like to make maybe one more question before we finish our session because we we have. I think this is the most extended session we had so far, but we had a really interesting conversation. Uh, but I also would not like to uh, abuse too much of Sarah's time because she mentioned she's uh, extremely busy and we are already so lucky <laughs> to have her here. So any, any further questions? Well, can I make a quick comment you know, to Lily? Can, can we all agree that architecture is a public activity? not a private activity. Yes, we may have private spaces that we enjoy, but in the end, when we're thinking about ethics and trying to make those decisions, Lily, I think we are designing not only for that person who's, who's paying your bill, right? But we're, we're really designing for the public. We're designing for the community, that house, that apartment building, that library, all of them equally are going to exist in time within the public realm. And this is something that we've really lost sight of, at least where we happen to live right now. That is one of our biggest problems. I think we all know that. And I think if we're going to address the, these huge issues together and to address them in a, you know, in a bold and courageous way, which I think we must, that those questions of public and private are central to the conversation, right? It's a public activity. It's a communal activity, the work of the architect. Well, does anybody disagree? I would love to hear disagreements. Well, I, 
I think it is public, but then the question of who is the community always pops up in, in, my, in my class because we do institutions for the public. And then well, what if you have 50% of the people who live in this park are homeless and 50% are not homeless, right? So we have this two factions, right? And, and they each have different needs. They different have wants. And um, so how do we how do we figure out who is the community? Who is the public? Tatiana, and just making making a comment here, um, we also have to have to think, of course, ideally, I agree with you, in an ideal world, we should be thinking about the public and the community. But if we think about who has the power to actually make commissions for architects, and it's often people who are who are privileged, who have the privilege to hire a, a client and perhaps to custom made a, a place uh, where they can live or, or they can work. Um, and very often um, this might be somehow disconnected from the community because the client might have very particular desires, very specific needs. And this is also something that from the side of the clients uh, would also have to evolve culturally. The client would also need to understand and perceive her or himself, not just uh, as an absolute individualist who completely tailors the world according to her or his needs, but also as someone who, who is a part in a larger whole, so to say. Well, this is undeniable, right? But, you know, if we are speaking about ethics today, then I think that's an important part of the of the question you know who who is who are all of our clients we have multiple clients we have the client who writes the check ultimately our most important client is you know includes the community includes the city includes the public realm whether it's a small house or or a real, really a public building like a museum or a library so I think these are all questions that we struggle with and there are no easy answers. But I do believe in the public realm myself. Absolutely, Tatiana, and I also agree with you and thank you so much for this uh, really important uh, input. We will need to finish our session now because I know that Sarah also can uh, can spend more time with us. So I thank everyone for being here and I especially thank Sarah for this wonderfully deep and uh, thought provoking uh, lecture and conversation. And I hope maybe someday in the future we can meet in person and, and continue sharing, I'd, sharing thoughts. I'd love that. And thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Bye everyone. And see you for the last one. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. Bye.